Well, thank you for coming. Uh, we appreciate everybody today. Um, you know, I'm glad that you know nobody looks terribly damp. I know several people rode over here, you know, from if they live pretty close. It's just easier to take the boat, you know, rather than your car. Um, the, the really good news is we have covered parking underneath, and um, and they do have really good pumps. Okay, and um, so don't worry. Even if we have one of those frog strangler uh, rainstorms in East Texas, that's what you grew up understanding was that it could rain hard enough to strangle a frog. And uh, you know, and so um, we have some of those here. And uh, there's a gentleman visiting with us from Chicago, and I was laughing, telling him, I said, you know, if you don't like the weather, just wait a little while. You know, like, it'll be different by this afternoon, and tomorrow will be another day. And so we're delighted you came. Thanks for joining us today. Um, as most of you know, um, and you've heard this before, uh, we're really delighted to start a new season of the Aspire sessions. We have some really great things planned this year, um, just like our speaker today. But we're going to bring in some different people to talk about maybe education in Dallas and DISD. Um, we're going to tell you truly maybe how dismal it really is in, in South Dallas of trying to get your child educated and how bad it is. Um, bringing in somebody to talk about strategic planning in corporate. It's a, it's a, um, a SEAL and a um, you know, special forces type person is going to come in, excuse me, that's going to come in in the spring and April and talk and stuff. Um, I've been in some of his sessions. He, he makes you want to go run into battle you know, when you're done. Um, the, um, uh, in the fall, we've actually got a political economist scheduled in September that's going to talk about you know, what happens if we have a Democrat, what happens if we have a Republican, what happens with different changes in the government with all of this, uh, to give you a new view. But we're delighted to have you. Uh, we're delighted to you know, have everybody here today in spite of, like I said, the weather. I want to start off by introducing, and most of you know that we do a lot of introducing nonprofits and different types of special programs and stuff for just a few minutes. We've got James Leffler here today from the Dallas Symphony Orchestra. Kim and I are both, and Kim's my wife, we're both really big believers of you know, the arts and both the impact and positive things it can do for business, but also the other impact it can have on demographic. Kim would tell you in her life that she became a classical ballerina. She was able through the arts to end up getting um, scholarships and to go to college and do different things like that. It gave her a path and a methodology to follow and that she would never be where she is today without that. So she actually sits on the DSO board, the OPA board, the Texas Ballet board, uh, probably half a dozen other ones. There probably even some I don't know. And uh, they, uh, but I wanted James to come and talk to you a few minutes today about what DSO is doing with some of their Southern Strings program, and I'm sure I used the right term for it, but some of the things they're doing like that. Um, and you know, to kind of give you a new view, uh, hopefully you'll be around if you're interested in attending or hearing or talking more about being involved with the symphony, they're always looking. The other really cool thing after Tooth Their Horn, they actually now lease and control the Meyerson, no longer the city of Dallas trying to figure out how to run a facility. So one of the cool things, if you go to the symphony now and get a glass of wine, you can take it and sit down and listen to the symphony while you're having your wine, okay? And you know, and if, yeah, bravo. <laughs> and, uh, they, uh, and so there's some really great changes going on. I'm not gonna steal this letter and let me talk to you. Great, thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you all for your time. It's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, I do wanna pick up and carry a few notes off uh, Greg about the Meyerson. So you may or may not know, we're actually celebrating the 30th anniversary of the Morton H. Meyerson Symphony Center. Uh, you may also not know that it's one of the top 10 concert halls in the world, right here in Dallas. So it's an incredible, not only artistic asset, but community asset for us. And taking over management control for the symphony means a couple of things. One, we can better leverage this asset to the benefit of our entire community. So not just for orchestra concerts, but to make it available to other nonprofits. It's also available for um, business meetings. For instance, ExxonMobil uh, used to hold their share, annual shareholders meeting in the Meyerson. So now we can really maintain it as a world-class facility and make sure that it continues to be the crown jewel of Dallas that it has been for the last 30 years, hopefully for generations to come. Uh, Greg also mentioned a new education program that we have in South Dallas, and he alluded to the fact that the opportunities for children in that part of our community are not the same as the opportunities that we want our own children to have. So the symphony has taken ownership of a key part of that, and that's music education. And for us, this is not about creating the next generation of great musicians, or even the next generation of symphony patrons. And while those would be happy results, it's about something much more fundamental. 
and that's that we know from a great body of research that music has an incredible impact on brain development, on uh, cognitive skills, and on the overall educational experience. And the earlier that that is available to children in their educational development, the better off they're gonna be, and the more success they're gonna have, and the more they'll be able to be uh, participatory contributing citizens in our community once they grow up or enter in the workforce. So the Dallas Symphony just this past summer launched a large scale, long term commitment to provide free instruments and free uh, private or small group lessons to as many children in Southern Dallas as we can reach. So since this summer we've already been serving 400 children and we plan to grow to 1,000 by the end of this calendar year and keep growing to we're literally putting instruments in the hands of every child in uh, this part of our community that's interested in doing that. So we've partnered with the ISD. We're in six different school sites. We deploy the program in after school programs. So we're not recreating the wheel in terms of that infrastructure. We're right there where the kids are. And Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday afternoons for two hours, they get dedicated private instruction that otherwise would cost them and their families thousands of dollars a year and be completely inaccessible. And so to give you a sense for the impact this program can have, we have another program that's been in place for 30 years and it's not nearly as large scale and it's designed for underrepresented youth who already play an instrument and have demonstrated an aptitude for that and want to study it in college. We call that our Young Strengths Program. In that 30 year history, it has a 100% high school graduation and college placement rate among its participants. So we're not gonna see that same impact from our broader based program that we're just launching in Southern Dallas, but if we can capture even 70% of that result for the children we serve, it's gonna have a really big impact, not just in their lives from an artistic perspective, but much more importantly, from their educational opportunities and then from a workforce development perspective, uh, helping build out our workforce talent and skill set here in Dallas. So we're really excited about that. I'd be delighted to share more with you if you'd like. We're always happy to take somebody down to see the program. And one other offer I'll make, if, if you're interested, connect with me afterwards. Uh, I'd love to provide a pair of free tickets for you and a guest to come here at Concert of Your Choice for the rest of the season. So i got a question. Mm -hmm. Is yes. it true that they don't have to use amplifiers in the buyers? That is true, and we don't for our classical. Uh, Russell Johnson is the acoustician. He worked, so it's an interesting story. We, we contracted IMP, of course, as the architect, and normally the hierarchy is the architect is, is the boss, and the acoustician reports to the, the architect, which makes the acoustics secondary to the design. So Mort Meyerson, then Ross Pearl hired to, or uh, uh, recruited as a volunteer to run the building committee was a 10-year process from conception to completion. Mort did something brilliant, and it's why Ross put his name on the building. He made I.M. Pei and Russell Johnson equals, and while that was an interesting pair to manage, because as you might imagine, their egos and perspectives didn't always agree, it resulted in one of the best acoustical environments in the world right here in Dallas. Yeah, it's a phenomenal facility. Uh, Kim and I, we, we go regularly. Um, I'm not as much of a classical fan as I am of Pops and some of the other things that they have. Some of the guest musicians, I know that um, there have uh, been a number of different special singers and stuff that come through. Who was it that was recently? Yeah. Bernadette Peters. Bernadette Peters was there doing a concert with the symphony. There's stuff like that that you can go see. It's, it's really interesting, really great. But um, I want everybody to hear about DSO. We think it's something that is a real jewel. And, and the arts and business, I think it's so important to, to be able to attract people to a world-class city. You gotta have a world-class arts type program. And you gotta have facilities like the Myers. You got institutes like the DSO. So we appreciate you sticking around and saying hi to James today and, and participating. So thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Well, now a quick commercial. Um, Chapman Hex, as most of you know, um, we've been around a number of years, but this is actually our 30th birthday this year. Um, I'm really excited. I started practicing when I was 10, and so, you know, you know being 40, and, you know, having to work around Simon, I look a little worn, but, you know, a little bit older, but, you know, but, you know, that's his fault, okay? And, uh, no, we have really enjoyed it. The 30 years has really flown by. Um, I, I'm getting, we're really working to set the firm for another 30, 50 years to let it continue on as some of the other names we've seen in Dallas. Um, 
One of the things that we do a lot for our clients is help them find solutions, whether it's in financial reporting, taxation, mergers and acquisitions, sales of companies, hand-holding people when things blow up and being that alternative. We would love to help you or love to help your clients or your friends. You know, if you've got questions about something we can do, we have a very robust audit practice, tax practice, do a ton of tax planning. We do a lot of due diligence. We do a lot of investment banking transactions in that group, uh, as well as the wealth management when clients have had a liquidity event. So let us know how we can help. Um, on the table today, too, is some information. If you're interested in having CPE credit, you need that, you can turn that in. There's speaker evaluation forms and stuff there. Um, you know, feel free to stick around here today. Um, if you want to network some afterwards, that's certainly what this is all about on either bookend for, for the event today. Uh, we're going to have Michael, and I'm going to introduce him in a second, but we're going to give him a few minutes to talk, have a little Q&A session, and we'll have you out of here by 9 o'clock. That's our goal. That if you need to head out to the office, you're able to do that. Um, so again, thank you for coming today and getting out in the weather and stuff. I want to introduce our speaker today and make sure I get all your details correct. Michael Gordon is actually a 12-time serial entrepreneur. You're going to hear about that today. You know, so he's got a dozen of these. You know, and, and he looks younger than I do. You know, so you know, and uh, he's holding up well. You know, so he's also a best-selling author, and today he's going to talk about success and near-death experiences. We're delighted to have you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Well, thank you this morning. Um, my favorite story is, if you build this company, you will go to prison. And I'll tell that story in just a second. A lot of my presentation is going to, I'm going to wrap in and out of um, some of my mountain climbing experiences and uh, tough situations I've been in. This, um, and, and most of the photographs are, are mine. Um, this one, that's not me, but I'm over here on this piece of the ice and turning and taking the picture. So, um, you know, if anybody's ever climbed an ice fall, they're pretty scary because, you know, you chip in you, and you just hope that one of your contact points, which is one, two, three, four, um, is going to hold up. Because inevitably, when you're going up an ice fall, something doesn't work. And inevitably, when you build a business, something doesn't work. Um, so, and uh, uh, about when, when Greg was 10, I decided to write a book and I started putting together the notes of it and, and just last year we released this book, uh, myself and two co-authors called Broken Handoff. And so a lot of the lessons uh, that I'm going to talk about today are in this book. So um, if you build this, you will go to prison. In 2002, I started a company called Teladoc. And with Teladoc, uh, we, were, we were doing something that we thought was new and in innovative. I, uh, I worked with a, a very well-known uh, medical doctor who built uh, a, a huge program for the state of Texas. Uh, he was a flight surgeon for NASA. He was an electrical engineer. He was an MD. And he knew everybody on the Texas Medical Board. So we build this model, we test it for two years, we go to the board and we tell them with great excitement, this is how we're going to change the world, this is how we're going to make medicine better. And the lead member of the board looks at me and says, Mr. Gorton, if you build this company, you will go to prison. And Dr. Brooks, we will take your medical license and then you'll go to prison. So um, anybody know the company Teladoc? It's a almost $10 billion NASDAQ or uh, NYSE company right now. Um, uh, my old company is now treating about 40 million patients a year, delivering doctors to patients in 12 minutes or so for $40. So it's a great success. The board was wrong, fortunately. I never went to prison on this. But, you know, starting a company is tough, and most companies do fail. Um, so, you know, I'm an entrepreneur. There may be some venture capital people in this room. And so I'm going to be really careful about how I say this. But why do entrepreneurs call venture capital vultures? 
You know, you can talk to almost any entrepreneur who's built a company, and they, uh, and they don't say venture capital, they say vulture capital. Well, here's the thing. In the venture capital world, the metric is, out of 10 companies, seven are going to fail. That's their metric. They build their model around it. They know seven are going to fail. They make money in that model. But imagine that you're a third or fourth or fifth time entrepreneur, and you've built this company. You brought all of your friends and family, and you put your blood and sweat equity into it. Uh, you've gotten through venture capital due diligence. That's hard stuff. And then you're part of the 70%. Because every single one of those companies that makes it through the due diligence process is a great company. 70% failure is an unmitigated disaster for the entrepreneur. But it's part of the metric for the VC. It's a scary metric. And, um, you know, it's, uh, uh, you know, missing part of this. I don't know. Um, Ten percent are home runs, and um, and then uh, ten to, or to twenty percent end up becoming just average, run-of-the-mill companies. So that's that's the way that metric works. Sorry, you can't see the um, left edge. Um, so how do we fix this? Um, there, there's an old saying. The early bird gets the worm. And I, uh, you know, as a 12-time serial entrepreneur, I mentor young entrepreneurs all the time. And one of the things I tell them is, you have got to be the early bird. You know, you, it, uh, when I was building Teladoc, people said, um, OK, if, if this was such a great idea, United Healthcare would do it. Some major corporation is going to do it, right? But entrepreneurs, we can make decisions like that. Major corporations are, are, are aircraft carriers. It takes them a day to turn around. And entrepreneurs can turn around 50 times in an hour. And, and so you know, my lesson to young entrepreneurs is, you've got to be the early bird. But who knows the second half of this famous saying? The second half is the scary part. The second mouse gets the cheese. And so we, um, excuse the, um, the tough situation here, but um, you know, the first mouse has been um, captured and destroyed, and, and the second mouse just comes along and it's like, thanks, Herman, appreciate the cheese. And you know, in, in my particular case, so I, you know, I, I mentioned that uh, Teladoc is, um, uh, now closing on $10 billion NYSE. And when I was ready to leave Teladoc, it was mostly because as an entrepreneur, I know what I am. I know what I'm good at and I know what I'm not good at. And um, healthcare is really tough. I don't have a PhD in healthcare. We needed somebody who did. And we brought in a guy named Jason Gorbick. And in the beginning, I, you know, I spent a lot of time with Jason getting him up to speed. We gave him a lot, a lot of stock. We gave Jason more stock than I had at the time. Um, Jason is now worth over $200 million. And let's just say, I'm not. Thanks for the cheese, <laughs> Michael. <laughs> so, um, you know, but at the, part, of, part of my concept in writing a book called Broken Handoff, you know, is what is the handoff? It is me handing the baton to Jason. And when Jason takes the baton, there's a couple things I want. First and foremost, I'm the dad. Teladoc is my baby. I'm handing my baby to Jason and saying, you know, treat her well. Do well with her. Well, I'll say it again. $10 billion NYSE company. Thank you, Jason. You treated my daughter really well. I appreciate it. But the second half is, you know, do we have to uh, when, when we do these handoffs, do we have to lose in the process? Do, um, do we have to end up with almost nothing 
when they end up with the $10 billion prize. And I'll tell you this, anybody um, have a daughter in the room? You know, there's nothing more precious than that. And at the end of the day, you know, my rationalization on this, and m mom taught me that word rationalization, right? Some of you know the nuance of the definition, but m uh, my rationalization on this is really simple. And it's really easy to deal with, and that is the company made it. And um, if you go on Wikipedia right now and you, see, and you look up Teladoc, you'll see me, Dr. Brooks, we're the founders. Jason can lose his money. My daughter could divorce him and kick him out the door. But until I have Alzheimer's, I'm still the CEO. I'm the guy who founded it, right? So I get the credential, he gets the money. Um, and and I, think it's, I, I think that's a fair deal. Um, but one of the things that I have as a mission right now is to teach the financial executives that are part of early and growth stage companies and the founders of early and growth stage companies, how do you do a handoff without getting broken in the process financially? So, you know, get the credential for your daughter and uh, get the bank account at the same time. So, you know, there's a lot of stats here, um, uh, but what, at, at the end of the day, when, when my co-authors and I looked at hundreds of deals that were passed from the guys who created and built to either the venture capital or the M&A transactions, what we found is, you know, that 70% failure is almost all related to one thing. And it's the obvious thing that everybody in, in the room knows, but we forget almost all the time. And you know, we hear these things uh, as an entrepreneur. You know, we always say um, uh, it's, it's smarter to invest in an A team with a C plan than it is to invest in a C team with an A plan. Because the, the A team will figure out how to, how to succeed in spite of the difficulties of the plan, but a, a, um, a C team will give up pretty easily. And so um, this is Mount Hood, which I climbed um, when, uh, when Greg was 11. And, um, and I was nine, I think, right? I invited you to come with me, but you just didn't. <laughs> um, you know, are there any mountain climbers in the room? Zero, okay, so I can make stuff up now. <laughs> so, so um, uh, interestingly, the, um, the guy who I co-founded Teladoc with, Dr. Brooks, is my lifetime mountain climbing buddy. So um, we have a lot of experience climbing mountains. Um, you know, you, be, you can basically um, walk to this point um, without putting your crampons on, that's the, um, the the sharp things that you strap on your boots, and having your ice axe out and roped in and, and anchoring. Uh, but the rest of the way, and so you know, we started um, about midnight. We got here um, right as the sun was rising. Um, you want to be off of a mountain like this before noon, because in the afternoon there's lightning. And so um, to get from here up to the summit and back down was about five hours. So it doesn't look that far from here. It's like, oh, you know, it's an easy jaunt. But, but the reality is it's very steep. Um, you know, some of these are 60 degree climbs or better. And um, it's very dangerous. And you rely on the person you're climbing with. And so, you know, we got up, we got down. We're sitting here later in the afternoon and, and uh, Dr. Brooks and I would always bring a can or a bottle of some special beer. And, we, and after we got off the hard part, we'd, we'd drink it. And so we're sitting there um, on, this, uh, on this point, you know, looking at, you know, we, we can essentially run down the rest of the way. So what took us five, six hours to get up, we can get back down in an hour. Um, and, and I'm saying to Dr. Brooks, you know, there's lots of crevasses on this mountain. And we didn't really see a single one. I want to go out. And, and see one. So from here, I can see one out about here. And you know, in my estimation, it's about a five minute walk out there. And he said, 
put your crampons on. Remember the crampons? I don't know, the sharp barbs. And I went, no, it's, it's pretty flat. I'm just going to walk out. Listen to your friends and your advisors. So I walk out, um, and, um, and, and the, the, you know, this is the afternoon. The ice is beginning to melt, um, so it's slick. And I've got my pack on, but my crampons are over there with Dr. Brooks. And my ropes are over there with Dr. Brooks. But um, so I, I fall, and it's just like, if anybody's ever fallen on ice, it happens, boom, just like this. And then you're on this steep slope like this. And so I'm sliding down here, and um, I didn't get to see the crevasse that I wanted to see, but I saw this one. Because um, essentially, what I, as I was sliding to my death, I thought, OK, my my axe is in the back, so I grab it with both hands and just, I'm doing this, trying to stop my fall because I see this thing coming. And you know, you can't tell from this picture, but this is about 60 feet. And all of this ice in here is razor sharp. So um, yeah, you're gonna hit, and, and, um, but you won't die when you get to the bottom of the 60 feet because you have already been sliced to death before you get there by the sharp ice. So, um, you know, there's a valuable lesson here, and that is, you know, sometimes you see something, you think, this is going to be really easy. I can do this. And um, trust me, you're wrong. If somebody, <laughs> if some, if somebody is, um, uh, you know, telling you, um, put your crampons on, you probably ought to think twice and put your crampons on. So, um, but, you know, this is, this is, his perspective as a medical doctor engineer and my perspective as an idiot on that day. So in, in, in 2000, I climbed Kilimanjaro. I had just sold a company called Internet Go Global for $122 million. I was rich. I called all my buddies. I said, um, you know, let's Let's climb Kilimanjaro. We can go to Africa. I got a whole bunch of money in the bank. I'll pay for everybody's gear. Um, and of course, Dr. Brooks was one of them. And um, so Kilimanjaro is a five-day climb, the route we took it. There's something called the Coca-Cola route. If anybody's interested in climbing Kilimanjaro, you can take the, Kilim the Coca-Cola route. We didn't. We took the hard route. And this is a picture of me on summit day. Um, uh, you, hopefully you can see the look on my face. I don't normally look like that. <laughs> this stuff right here is called scree. And, and scree for mountain climbers is that you're one of your worst enemies. Because you take, you're, you're, you're going up, you're at, at this point in time, 17,000 feet of elevation. So there's, not air, there's no air up there. Anybody, anybody seen these movies, these mountain climbing movies where these guys are at 18, 20,000 feet and they're running? That's Hollywood. Nobody runs at 20,000 feet. There's not enough air. You take, when, when, when you're this high, and when you see the real um, movies of people climbing mountains, what you see is they're doing this. You know why? Because there's no air there. You're, you're out of breath going three steps of uh, stairs. And um, so, and that's, and, and it's, it's even worse in a situation like this where scree, you take a step forward and you slide half a step back um, because it's so steep and the rock is so loose. So you hate this stuff. And, um, and everything is telling you, you could just go back. It would be so easy just to turn around. You've made it to 17,000 feet. Why well, make it to 19,850 or whatever? Um, so you're really tired. In our particular case, you know, we got out of this scree field, and, um, and we got to the summit, and one of my climbing partners hands me this sheet of paper. And I, I, I didn't know what it was other than my daughter had drawn something for me, and, you know, not the same daughter who married Jason. That was Teladoc. This, <laughs> this daughter married a, an engineer. So, but... Um, and she was six years old. And I always told her, you know, believe in impossible dreams. When you wish upon a star, 
those kinds of things. And so that's basically what this was. It was me climbing the mountain and her saying, when you wish upon a star. So here's the most amazing story about this image. Um, when, when I sold Internet Global, uh, one of the guys who came in and bought a whole bunch of my stock that essentially funded this trip said, when you get back from Africa, I want a <coughs> personal uh, meeting where you show me the pictures of your climb. So I'm sitting with my daughter and, and this guy, Bill, who, uh, who wrote a huge check that I used to help fund this. And I'm taking him through this story and I'm telling him this about, you know, when you wish upon a star. And he gets really quiet. And I said, what's up, Bill? And he said, did I ever tell you where I got my money from? And I said, no, you didn't. And he said, my uncle wrote that song for Disney, When You Wish Upon a Star. And he died, and I inherited the, the estate. And so, you know, there's another place where kind of you, you, serendipity kind of leads back in a, in a mountain climbing, you know, start. And, and the whole time we were climbing this mountain, Dr. Brooks was saying, I want to start this company. It's called Cyber Medical Services, where doctors talk to patients on the, on the telephone. And I'm like, Cyber Medical Services? That's like your brain is exploding, right? Who wants to build a company? So Cyber Medical Services, that he was talking to me the whole time, became Teladoc. So, um, you know, uh, companies fail for a whole bunch of reasons. And um, mostly, the, when, when people don't know when to quit or when not to quit. And um, so the iGlobal, the Internet Global financing that we did, um, it, this is, um, the fall of 1998. I've been building Internet Global for five years. I'm ready to bring in some super professionals. And, uh, you know, if some of you may remember the nuance of the history of the Internet, but in, in 1992, when I started iGlobal, nobody knew what the Internet was. I would call chambers of commerce and rotaries and guys like Greg and say, I want to come give a talk and I want to tell them what the internet is. And I, I remember I would hold a business card up and I would say, this is an email address, this little at sign and this dot com, and people would go, the guy's a kook. I would say, everybody's gonna have an email address by the end of the 90s, and people were like, funny farm, you know, this guy is nuts. <laughs> well, you know, we made it. Um, but but there, was a, there was an interesting thing on the way to the forum. Um, I brought in, uh, one of the great CFOs in our city, and I brought in um, one of the guys who had run uh, a major company called WorldCom, which was a telecom company. And, you know, as, as a serial entrepreneur, I've been on payday pulling into the parking lot, looking at 80 cars, and not enough money for payroll. And, and, and you think about the implication. You guys are mostly finance people, so you get this. You pull in the parking lot, you see 80 cars and 80 mortgages and husbands and wives and children, and you're thinking, man, I gotta find money for payroll. I gotta do something, because all these people are depending on me. And so it's a big deal. You think about this a lot. And so I've passed to these two great seasoned executives and I walk into their office, or they come into my office, they throw some paper down on my desk, and they said, we need to call a board meeting. Well, it's the 1st of November, and I said, okay, what's up? And they said, um, we gotta close the company down. First, I think they're joking. Okay, what now? Yes, we don't have enough money for payroll December 31st. And I'm thinking, okay, I've been to work on payday and not had enough money for payroll and fixed it. And you're telling me we got two months and you want to close the company down? Yes. And I'm like, okay, CFO, you know, have you, have you looked at every single resource, every single customer? Is there any way? We yes, I have. There's nothing. Okay, new CEO, nothing. And I said, let me have the helm. Just give it to me for 30 days. So I solved the problem. Um, between the 1st of November and the end of November. How hard is it to money, raise money during Thanksgiving or Christmas? 
Not easy, right? But we solved the problem. And then, the first week of December, this company calls us and says, we want to buy you guys. Three months later, a $122 million transaction. Two months after they wanted to close our company down, you know, it's all about persistence. It's all about persistence. If you want to succeed, you have to be persistent. So um, in, in 2017, we, you know, I talked a little bit about 70, the 70% 70 metric in the venture capital world. See, I said venture, I didn't say vulture. Um, but we are in Texas. <laughs> so, um, but this, the 70% metric actually applies almost across the board in M&A transactions. Roughly 70% of all M&A transactions fail. And worldwide, those translated in 2017 to $3.5 trillion in losses. So, you know, um, about, about three years ago, I'm having breakfast with a friend of mine who says, oh, a friend of mine, a third person, wants to meet the founder of Teladoc. Can we have lunch or breakfast? And so, yeah, we have breakfast. And the guy is telling me he's in the human capital market and um, he's trying to figure out um, how he can pave the next pathway. And so I said, well, you gotta write a book. And I said, I'm actually working on one right now. Why don't you, why don't you join me? And my, and my other friend goes, well, wait, I want in too. So, you know, I, I'm now a published author, so I have to call, does anybody know Millie Brown? Some of you probably know her, right? I, she's, so Brown Books is my publisher. So I call Millie Brown and I go, Millie, um, you know the book I just started working on? Yes. I'm gonna bring in two co-authors. And Millie's like, no you're not. <laughs> yeah, I am. <laughs> Millie is a force of nature. Try not to um, go against what she says because she's probably right. But um, the, what, what we realized when we started doing this research was as an entrepreneur, you know, I can build Internet Global that I sell for $120 million or Teladoc that's now approaching $10 billion. And, um, but what if we could figure out something that's common in all of these transactions and fix 10% of them? You guys are all finance whiz. You can do 10% of 3.5 trillion dollars a year. I, I mean, it makes your hair stand up to think, is there something that's common in all of these so that we could just educate people on the seller side and the buyer side? Fix this and there's $350 billion that we can add back to the economy. And so that became our big mission um, with this with this book was, you know, what is it that, um, that's really happening? And um, the reality is, it's all people, you know? Um, the guy that took over Teladoc from me, we got a little bit crosswise and he doesn't call me anymore. He made a huge mistake um, about six months into him running Teladoc that if he had just, if, if we had maintained our connection, I could have solved this problem like this. Instead, Teladoc spent tens of million do of dollars on legal expenses fighting the state of Texas for something that, uh, well, in, in year one, about six months after they told me I was gonna go to prison, they sent me a note, it was basically, um, something was wrong with our website, they didn't like the way it was worded. I picked up the phone, I called the board, and I said, okay, Mary, what do you need me to do? She said, X, Y, Z, and I said, okay. I called her back an hour later, I go, can you have a look at it? And she goes, well, that was fast, thank you very much, you're done. They sent the same exact letter to Jason less than a year after I left, and he went and got Jackson Walker all lawyered up, they got an injunction against the board of medical examiners. Can you imagine this? If you know anything about boards of medical examiners, these guys have their own court, their own judges. You don't win. And, and so for the next five years, Teladoc fought the state of Texas in a battle that they wouldn't have won 
except for the fact that they, the, the board made a huge mistake. They were so mad that Teladoc got an injunction against them that the lady who was running the board was in a restaurant and she said, oh yeah, Teladoc, I'm gonna crush that company. I don't care if they're good or bad. And somebody from the Austin Statesman heard her say it in the restaurant and published it. And you know, the whole thing unraveled and they had to, but that's the only reason why Teladoc won that battle because they wouldn't have um, when you, know, you have your own judge, jury, or jury and executioner. So, you know, culture and people are everything. That is the solution. If you're doing an M&A transaction, you've got to figure out who's on this side, who's on this side. If you know there's going to be a cultural clash, up front, set it up. Get somebody in there who can intermediary. Bring in uh, an entrepreneur in residence who knows that language. Recognize that on the finance side, you have Wharton scholars who are some of the smartest people in the world. These Harvard MBAs, they're collegial, they love each other, they know a lot. And on the other side, you've got these guys who climb the faces of, of, of ice mountains and they're scared of nothing and they'll do anything to succeed. They will do sleepless nights and the two of them oftentimes don't mesh well. But you can help them mesh well and that is the number one way to solve this problem. So um, in the end, it's all about the people. And that is the end of my speech. <laughs> so thank you. We've got a couple minutes for questions. Yes, sir. So you talked uh, earlier about merging <coughs> cultures. Right. The hardest thing I ever did was take a Texas company, acquire a New Hampshire company, and the cultures were so different, mm -hmm. we lost 80% of the New Hampshire people. Right. How do you merge those cultures, or do you just not do it, or do you just decide that's okay, what we're acquiring is okay? But we never figured out how to merge a Texas culture with a New Hampshire culture. We brought them down here, they left, we yeah. couldn't figure it out. Yeah, well, I mean, it is New Hampshire after all. We are Texans. <laughs> so, no, I mean, look, the, you have to find the common grounds. That's what you always do. You find the common grounds. And, um, and the common mission. And so, you know, they all believe in what it is that they're doing. They all believe in the company that they're building. And you have to stay focused on that. But, I mean, oftentimes you do, people do have to go. That's part of the process. But um, <clears throat> you have to stay in front, of the, in front of the curve so you don't lose it in the process. Yes, sir. Hi, Michael. Reed Rasmussen. Um, you spoke on your prior slide, you were referencing that you've got to merge these cultures, and the cultures you were talking about merging were the M&A team and the entrepreneurial team. Correct. And yet this question was really, when, when I hear you <coughs> reference, you've got to merge cultures, I was thinking about the merging of, you know, a couple of different companies' cultures. Where do you think the failure more often hits? Is it more with the entrepreneur and the M&A team, or is it that if you're merging a couple of companies together, that those two separate cultures don't mix well? Where do we fail more often? Well, um, you know, in the world that I live in, it is the early stage, it's the, it's the ice climbers and the Harvard MBAs, <coughs> right? Um, but, but I think that at the end of the day, both of them have the same goal. And, and that was the main point I was trying to make is that you know, you can work together for the same goal. Is that answering your question? Yeah. It's a lot of stuff you've done, though, so thank yeah, you. That, um, the, uh, yes. And remember, my goal is one in 10. Figure out how to get one in 10, and we'll still have nine failures. And guys like you, Reed, will figure out how to get the next one. That's right. Yeah. Um, how do you define it? You know, I mean, it's, 
Well, you, it's a, it, you can articulate, um, you know, in order to articulate what your culture is, you got to define it. Correct. And so, is there like a Myers Briggs for a corporation uh, that says this is, that, is, this you know, is our culture that, and boom, boom, boom? So, you know, Myers Briggs is really interesting. I did a, I, I did a personal study with Myers Briggs where I did it every single day for a week. And I got four different, I ended up in four different squares. And so, but there, um, there's, there, is a, um, there is a new uh, deal that you'll see sometime around the end of the year this year. Um, the, um, there's a lady who created something called Genius Key. And does anybody remember an old book called The Peter Principle? Yeah. Yeah. So essentially The Peter Principle, for those of you who don't remember, mean, means that, um, you're very talented, you keep rising until you get, in, you get put into a slot where your talents no longer work, and then you're stuck there. That's the Peter Principle. And you're not good at that slot. And so basically, um, this lady has created this thing called Genius Key, which is similar to Myers-Briggs, only it says that some things you're gonna be good at and some things you're not. And she tries to figure out exactly what you're good at so that, um, uh, management can look and go, okay, I've got this kind of problem and that guy's got the genius key and that woman's got the genius key, bring them together for this project. And so, you know, I think uh, in, in that particular case, but the thing that you have to remember in a merger of my kind of company and a traditional company is that we are all blood, all everything to solve every single problem. And they are all intellect to solve every single problem. And um, you know, how do you make those two things mesh? And sometimes it's not easy because they think they're the smartest people in the room and these guys think they're the smartest people in the room. And you know, that's why I'm still saying one in 10 and not. Yeah, but I'm, I'm not gonna let you off the hook that Okay, again. okay, hit me again. <laughs> I'm looking for a rubric um, that's something that says, if I'm gonna merge this culture and this culture, I need to define these cultures and find out where there's overlap and consistency right. where there's not, where there's difference. Yep. And I'm trying to differentiate in my head between culture and simply philosophical differences um, in, in approaches, maybe. And okay, so, so if, 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 I'm on, on. if I'm on this side of the fence and I'm saying, I'm the Harvard MBA, what do I live in? I live in a spreadsheet world. But I need to recognize that I'm not working with spreadsheet world people. What I need to do for this particular company is I need to say, it doesn't matter what's going to happen, this guy is going to find a solution. And then from this guy's perspective, he needs to be taught, okay, this is the smartest guy in the room. He made it through Harvard as an MBA. And you think you're smart, you're good at climbing the ice axe. You're good at missing the potholes. Listen to him when he gives you a spreadsheet. But, but, but why should I listen to him? I'm the one who built this company. This is my baby. Well, the answer is because He's going to have some solutions. You're moving into a brand new world. You have lots of money now. Um, so you've got to have, what, how do you do this? You find somebody in the middle that if these two can't communicate, make sure that this guy still does his all-nighters and this guy makes sure the spreadsheet and the analysis is done right. So I know it's not a rubric. I haven't developed a rubric. What I've, what I've, what I've de developed is an understanding that it is that friction once this guy, once this, so trust me, I did this. I did this to my, my venture capital partner who was a Wharton scholar in a board meeting. He was telling me about a spreadsheet and my management team was spread so thin we couldn't do anything. And I looked at him and I said, you're nothing but a snot-nosed kid. You've never built anything. You have no idea what the blank you're talking about. And um, while technically my comment was right, <laughs> essentially what I did was I, I created the broken handoff that day. There was never going to be a meeting of the minds between me and that Wharton scholar ever again. Why? Because I didn't have somebody in the middle telling me, Gordon, don't do this. You know, I don't care if you're right or not, this guy is an asset, and he needs to learn that you're an asset. And, um, you know, that's how, you, oh, you know, I, I learned my lesson. So, yeah. Mike, I'm gonna take it back to something that you can relate to, which is mountain climbing. Yep. I went to school 13,000 feet above sea level. 
Wow. I went to snap those boys for nine months out of the year. And what they would do first thing, the first week we would all go out and do something similar to Outward Bound. Yeah. And it was about breaking down cultural barriers because we had kids from all over the world. Right. Right? And it was to walk away from that week with mutual trust <coughs> and mutual respect. And to me, that's something that's worked really well. So, but you guys got put in, into an impossible situation where you all had to work together. Um, and that was survival. And my example in my boardroom meeting was me being an idiot um, and saying something that would, so that's the pathway. And if there's going to be a rubric, which I'm sorry, I don't have one yet, but um, it's gonna come from developing something like how do you put them into a common situation? Every time we've been in an M&A situation, we take the leadership team, go away for a week, and do something like Outward Bound. Mm -hmm. And you either come out trusting and respecting each other, and it's going to work, or it's not going to work. Correct. And, you know, we chime, and we're going to chime in from this <laughs> fact that we do, like you, a lot of deals. And we refer to it as a social perspective. How do you operate, and this is where I think you start at the top with your comment, how do you operate your company? How do you treat your people? How do you deal with problems? How do you solve those? That's where people have to come to the top together to figure out. And I think that needs to be done way before the deal is actually, probably as part of the diligence process all the time. Mm -hmm. I think people wait till after, and then they're already too deep in. And we see a lot of things we go, it probably should have never happened. But, and, and because if they had sat down and said, we got two different social cultures that are never gonna match, this is not gonna work. And you made the comment earlier, we were trying to do a deal with IBM one time, and I'll never forget, and you made the exact comment about the, the big destroyer and the big ship, and he said, if we want to change and do something, you're an entrepreneur, you can move your boat over and the slip, we have to go up and sail up in the sunset, and two weeks later, we can move into the boat next door. Those are such different worlds socially, and people just have such a rub until trying to figure out at a very social, like you said, forget about spreadsheets, forget about all the numbers, how are we actually gonna function and work together as a family kind of environment? What do we do? And, and I love the Albert Bound idea, and I like the idea of taking people and going and sitting down. And I think you do that in many deals from a management meetings and you know, and all those kinds of discussions, but it's a lot of cases I don't think will drill down into that piece. And, you know, uh, we laugh. What is it? The two huge things that we see from failures are either failed software conversion nowadays creates a huge problem with companies failing, or a failed integration. Those are the two major things to your comments today that we see when we look at deals that people call us and go, okay, we did this deal, now it's on the rocks. How do we finance it? What do we do with it? How do we dispose of it? What do we do? And, you know, and it's really sad to think that a lot of times we as business people get so down into the numbers and not enough above it all to figure out what's the people factor? How's that gonna work? Mm -hmm. And those people in New Hampshire, I think they're weird. But we <laughs> work with them. And you know, at the end of the day, we gotta work with them. And they think we're all stupid. We're stupid people who wear, yeah. We think we're all stupid people who wear cowboy boots. I mean, it's amazing when you go around the globe, the people all think that we in Texas ride a horse to work. <laughs> they really do. We should. And, you know, and, and it's <laughs> figuring out how to cross those barriers. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Picking on our tax guys over here. Well, listen. Thank you um, so much. I, I, I put my email address up here because I want to hear from you. The, I, it, the, at the end of the day, it's all about the people. And um, please write my email address. Email me. Connect with me on LinkedIn. I, um, if I can help with anything you're doing, and I'm doing, I, I'm always doing things that I can use help with. So um, please reach out to me. We hope you'll um, enjoy today, but that you'll also put some dates on your calendar. Uh, our next Aspire is March 11th, and the one after that is April 8th. Um, like I said, we're getting our speakers lined up and working through that process, but we'd love to have you. That will work through our spring speakers and stuff. Uh, please stick around today. Um, you know, there's still food out there, uh, plenty of coffee. Um, and then also just make sure that, you know, if you want to come back in the future, we don't have you your guests today. You know, pass off your card outside, make sure you sign up. Uh, Michael's going to be around in a few minutes. If you want to talk to him, pick his brain some, I'm sure he'd be glad to, to chat. Uh, and again, let us know if we can ever help. Um, we live like he does in this world of, of constant, you know, most of it's failures, and you're trying to figure out how to solve problems. So um, have a great day, stay dry, and stay warm. Thanks.